Great, so I think we can get started. Uh, this is Elizabeth Pendergrass, and I'd like to welcome all of you to today's webinar, Using Benchmarking to Quantify the Benefits of Process Improvement. Before we begin, I would like to make you all aware of a few technical items. All of you who are listening on the conference call are currently on mute. So to ask a question at any point during the presentation, simply use the Q&A dialog box shown in the right-hand side of the WebEx screen. Larry will field as many of these questions as he has time for at the end of the presentation. And if he doesn't have time to answer your question, don't worry, he will respond to all of these via email. And he'll also provide his contact information at the end of the presentation for any further questions you might have. I'll start by quickly introducing our presenter today, Larry Putnam, Jr. As co-CEO of QSM, Larry has 25 years of experience using the Putnam Slim methodology. He has participated in hundreds of benchmarking, estimation, and oversight service engagements. Larry has delivered numerous speeches at conferences on software estimation and measurement. And he has trained more than 1,000 software professionals on industry best practice measurement, estimation, and control techniques in the use of QSM's Slim Suite. Larry is currently responsible for the management of QSM's business development, research, and customer care programs. So without further delay, I'll let Larry get started. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth, and welcome, everyone. Um, as Elizabeth already said, today we're going to be talking about benchmarking and specifically how you can use benchmarking processes to uh, quantify the benefits of you know, changes or process improvement initiatives that you've got going on. So. The agenda that I've put together for, say, the next hour or so is I want to give you sort of a broad overview of how we see uh, benchmarking being applied in the, in the software development space. Um, it involves collecting some data, so you know, what is the right data that we should go try and capture uh, from a core minimum standpoint? Um, and then um, how do we look at data sets in terms of the demographics uh, of that data set? Uh, and what does it tell us um, when we when we uh, look at data in different ways? Um, then the first thing I'll be talking about is sort of an inward-looking benchmark. Uh, we call it a baseline. Um, and really what we're doing is we're collecting up a, uh, some data on a set of projects, and we're coming up with an internal benchmark. So what's the average performance of, of our projects, uh, and how do the individual projects compare to that, that organizational benchmark? Uh, it's very useful uh, when you're trying to identify outliers uh, from a good or, or a positive or, or um, not so good perspective. And then what we want to do is we want to dive into those outliers and try and understand why did they behave the way they behaved, good or bad. And uh, generally that will present us with some opportunities for things that we either are doing well and we want to continue to propagate throughout the organization or maybe some opportunities for process improvements, things that we want to make some changes and, and make ourselves you know, more efficient uh, down the road. And then I'll introduce the idea of you know, if, you're, if you're going to be making recommendations for changes, you want to build a business case you know, a, 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 as to why the organization should make those changes. Um, what, are, what are going to be the, the benefits of the economics around that if we are, we are able to affect some positive change? And then over time, if we continue to do baselines over time, we can use those baselines, we can compare them with one another, and it starts to provide a nice uh, trend. You know, are we improving? We're making those process improvement changes. You know, we're building the business case. Now we need to continue to measure to see whether that business case is being realized. Um, and then we'll, we'll turn our attention outward and we'll look at being able to do an external benchmark. So how can I compare you know, my organization, my project metrics with uh, other, with other uh, uh, companies and, that are in the, the similar space that I'm in? Okay, so we'll talk about how do you select appropriate data sets to make sure that we're doing valid comparisons externally, and then what are some ways that we can do those benchmark comparisons to assess how we stack up. So that's kind of the, uh, the plan for the next hour. Um, one of the things when I was putting this together is, you know, I know what I think of as benchmarking, but I thought it would be useful to go out and, 
you know, look on the internet to canvas what other definitions of benchmarking are out there. And as you can imagine, I came back with a, a whole bunch of different definitions, many depending on the, the industry that they were trying to apply it to. But this one resonated with me because it, it uh, uh, dovetails in very nicely with what I'll be talking about uh, during this presentation. So benchmarking is the process of comparing one's business processes and performance metrics to industry best and or best practices from other industries. Dimensions typically measured are quality, time, and cost. Improvements from learning mean doing things better, faster, and cheaper. And that very much encompasses uh, the, the process and what we'll be looking at to get out of benchmarking in, the, in the, our presentation today. So why do organizations typically want to benchmark? Um, generally, they're trying to assess either their internal or external competitive position. How do we stack up as an organization? Uh, in many cases, it's to support a process assessment, either to, you know, get a stake in the ground at a point in time and then, you know, be able to measure our progress as we go forward. So typical uh, assessments would be like a CMMI assessment or things like that. Um, uh, there are some organizations that want to be able to look at their suppliers and see what are my suppliers' capability and how do I negotiate more effectively with my suppliers. So that's another way that we might use benchmarking, you know, if we're procuring uh, services from outside vendors. Um, obviously, to be able to measure any improvement, we've got to get a stake in the ground, so it provides that baseline that we can measure against. And, uh, and it helps us quantify the benefits of making those improvements. Um, you know, we, we have these, uh, you know, we've spent three years going from CMMI level one to level three. Well, that's great, but what does that mean to the business in terms of the bottom line economics? You know, getting to market faster, less uh, costs, higher quality, things like that. And then the other byproduct of, of benchmarking is it also provides a basis for realistic estimation processes because any, you know, estimation process ought to use uh, an organization's own empirical data to support the productivity assumption. So it provides a very nice capability to them when we're looking at new projects, we use that benchmark data to decide what's reasonable and what's not. So it puts us in a very nice negotiation position. Uh, QSM has a number of solutions in this benchmarking area. We have consulting services that we offer. Uh, we call it a high performance benchmark service where our consultants will come in and do the data capture, uh, do the analysis, and present the results back. We have uh, products uh, that do this as well. So our slim metrics and data manager products are, are the tools that we actually use to do our benchmarking uh, services. Uh, so they, slim metrics lets you do the analysis work, and data manager is the repository that stores the, the, the data that you've captured. And then more recently, we've come out with a set of web-based uh, enterprise products called Slim Web Services, and there's two of those services that specifically address benchmarking. There's the closeout service, which is designed for when a project finishes up, we want to capture the core metrics and then do a, ver a very quick performance assessment on that project. So it gives the project team a very quick assessment in real time after their project's done on how well it went. And then the benchmarking service lets you do a similar thing but to collections of projects. And then as a, uh, as a, a resource to the software community up on our website, we uh, publish a series of performance benchmark tables. So these are uh, tables that are broken out by uh, complexity uh, of software. So you've got your IT, your engineering, your real time, and then over uh, a range of sizes within that database, we publish these performance tables. So you can take your projects, go into the appropriate data set at the appropriate size, and compare how your projects do. So that's a, a resource that's available out there. So what do we want to capture? Um, and I sort of break the data up into quantitative and qualitative. So the core quantitative data that we want to try and capture on our projects, and I've ordered them in a certain way. I've put size and scope front and center at the top, <laughs> because that's usually the metric that gets left off. Uh, but we need some way that we can measure you know, what we delivered uh, uh, for that project. And the metrics that you can use, there's a whole host of them. Um, Usually, size metrics uh, tend to change depending on where we are on a software project. At early on, they tend to be at a fairly abstract level, things like requirements and use cases, user stories. And then as we you know, re refine our, our requirements and design, then they tend to go and become more physical in nature, more types of components or implementation units that we're, we're actually implementing uh, those things in. 
Um, so what it tells you is the overall size of the system, which is very important because you'll notice that the, some of these other metrics depend on that, how long it takes, how much effort we're going to spend, and even how many defects we're going to create are very much tied to the size of the system. Uh, so that's an important thing to know. Um, and it also, if we're measuring it along the way, if we're, if we're in the middle of a project and we have an estimate of the overall size of the system, it tells us, you know, how, how much we have currently constructed and what the backlog is. And that's useful because from a size and scope perspective, it tells us how done we are. Um, other metrics that everybody's familiar with, schedule, obviously this is the calendar time that it's going to take to do the project. Um, and if we are measuring along the way things like task completion dates or key milestone dates, from a schedule perspective, that tells us how much of the schedule we've consumed and how done we are from a schedule perspective. Um, effort is going to be the labor uh, over that time frame. So you, know, you can measure this in different ways, person hours, person days, person weeks, person months. Uh, it's proportional to cost by whatever the labor rate is that we've got. And it tells us how we're, we're spending the money. Uh, so of the total budget that we've allocated for the project, how much have we, we spent? And obviously what we want to do is marry that up with the size and scope metric to see, you know, we've spent half the budget, how much of the size and scope do, have we currently, you know, constructed? And then finally, defects. So this is, uh, these are usually defined as, you know, deviation from specification. We usually break them out into a number of different severity levels from very severe to less severe. Um, and it tells you, um, if we have a way that we can predict how many uh, defects we should be finding, it tells us are we finding the defects at the right point in the project when we need to find them. Obviously, the earlier we can find them, the, the less expensive they are to, to correct or to fix. And it also tells us, if, again, if we're measuring it ongoing on a project, it tells us how stable the product is at different points in time, um, and, which is useful because on the back end of projects, the reliability is usually driving the delivery date. So if we can project out what is the reliability I need and what do I have now, we can then use that to project out when we're likely to get there. So that's the core quantitative data we want to try and capture. But we also want to capture uh, what I'll call qualitative information. So we want to get some demographics on the projects. You know, what types of applications were they? Um, you know, what uh, development classification were these? New development, enhancement projects, you know, binder bug fix and cleanup maintenance type, types of things. Uh, what industry sector would this project fit within? What technology was used? You know, either, you know, maybe we were implementing a package implementation in SAP or an Oracle that we might want to be able to use to measure against other similar types of projects. Or maybe, you know, we might want to capture the development class, you know, methodology. We're in some of our projects, we use a more traditional sequential waterfall methodology, but we've got part of the organization that's moving to more lean, iterative, agile uh, processes. So we might want to be able to compare those types of things. So. Um, we, we need some way that we can look at the demographics of our projects, and that's useful when I circle back towards the end and talk about external benchmarking. We'll use that to be able to go out and pull external data sets that match the demographics of, of our projects. Um, it's also useful to gather some information in three broad categories, you know, the tools and methods that we're using, um, the technical complexity of the system, uh, and the uh, and a profile of the team, you know, so that their skills and experience and cohesion and motivation and things like that. So this helps us when we're looking at the quantitative positioning of our projects and we see some outliers. These are some of the areas that we're going to dive into to try and understand, you know, why projects behave the way that they did. So uh, we also need some productivity, a comprehensive set of productivity metrics uh, that we can derive from, from our benchmark data. Um, a lot of people use uh, fairly traditional ratio-based metrics, so your classical economic output over input metrics, so things like function points per unit of effort or lines of code per unit of effort are pretty typical that you see out there. And what we have found is that those metrics don't tend to be mature enough to capture all the nuances of all the nonlinear behavior that you see in design processes and specifically in software. Um, so, you know, a couple things that, that you'll notice when you look at your industry data is that there's a very nonlinear change as the size of the system gets larger. There's a very nonlinear change in the schedule that it takes and and even more in how much effort it takes to develop the system. So um, that's going on and then 
The other dynamic that goes on on projects is how we resource them, and that is a absolutely a management decision. And sometimes if we feel like we're under schedule pressure, there's a tendency to put lots of people or, or resources on projects. And there's, again, a very nonlinear diminishing returns on the schedule compression that you get, but for a very in big increase in the cost. So that's why we need something that's maybe a little bit more comprehensive than, than the, the uh, output over input ratio. So what we've developed is what we call a productivity index. And it uh, tries to take that schedule, effort, and size into account, and it's also implicitly tied to the reliability of the system. So I'm just going to describe that to you. And we've got what we call a production equation that we use to uh, derive this productivity value. And you know, if you were to look at it conceptually, it would look something like this. We've got the, 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 the size and scope that we're going to deliver. That's going to be proportional to the effort. Uh, so the application of people over the time frame, and we're going to operate at some productivity level. Now, if I wanted to solve for that productivity value, I could just rearrange the equation into this form, and I could go get some completed projects where I know what we delivered, I know the time frame, I know much, how much effort we put into it, and I can empirically calculate this productivity value. Okay? So, you know, it has, it has size and scope in it, it has effort, but it also has the time frame built into it as well. And it, uh, I'm not showing it here, but it also has some exponents that get at that, some of those nonlinear behaviors that we talked about. So when I'm talking about productivity index on some of the benchmarking, this is kind of how we're, this is how we're deriving it. There's, if you go up on our website, there's actually some nice papers that show you exactly how it's calculated and the, the exact algorithms that go into it. But conceptually, it's, it's pretty simple. The overall scale goes to 1 to 40. High, higher values are better. So the higher your productivity index, the less time and the less effort it takes you to develop a certain amount of functionality. Just to kind of look at how, the, how software groups according to that PI, if I took a snapshot of projects out of our database, the QSM database, um, and I were to break them out into these sort of application zones, you'd see that they would group in three sort of complexity zones. So you have your business or IT projects up on the high end of the PI scale, generally lower in complexity to the engineering class software, which might you know, cluster in here in the 12 to 14, 15 range. And then you've got your very difficult systems, your very complex systems in what I'll call the real-time zone. You know, and those projects tend to cluster typically in the you know, 6, 8, 9 range. So, uh, this brings up a, a good point. When you're benchmarking, it's important that you benchmark against, uh, you know, uh, relevant data. In other words, if I'm looking at IT projects, then I want to be benchmarking against similar types of, of projects that are in that IT space. If you've got, a, if you've got uh, different types of software in your data, then you have to break it out and sort of benchmark them separately so you're doing an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. So anyway, that's, uh, that's the productivity index, and now we'll sort of switch gears and we'll talk about the benchmarking process that will use these metrics. So the general process that we use is we start off with a, a benchmark kickoff meeting. So this is where we're trying to gather together all the players that are going to be involved with the, you know, with the benchmark. So the coordinators, the people that will be providing the data, we're trying to set expectations on what we're trying to do, what we're trying to collect, how we're trying to collect that information. Uh, and then once everybody's on the same page, then we're ready to move into our, you know, data collection processes and our validation processes. So um, this is a very important step because we want to make sure we get good data so that when we're doing our analysis, people aren't, you know, refuting or, or challenging the results that we're getting because of the quality of the data. Once we've got our data sort of, uh, uh, you know, validated and everybody agrees that this is good data, then we, uh, we can look at doing our internal benchmark or our baseline. That's the inward looking uh, benchmark. Uh, we can also do our external benchmark where we're looking outside the organization from a competitive sort of standpoint. And then uh, once we've got all of our analysis done, we're ready to report our findings to whoever the, the information consumers are within the organization. And notice I've got these little arrows saying it's a closed loop cycle because we think that you need to be doing this at regular intervals. And usually 12 to 24 month cycles we think are reasonable periods of time, depending on the size of the organization and how many projects you know, they've got coming out, that'll give you a feel for what's the appropriate cycle for us. But generally this should be an ongoing thing because you're using it to establish what are our improvement trends over time. So 
a little bit about the kickoff meeting uh, here, what were the, the main objectives here, or we want to identify, you know, who's going to participate in the benchmark. Usually there's going to be some people that are going to be coordinating it, um, making sure that it's progressing according to uh, the timeline that we've laid out and the, the, the activities that we've got going on. Uh, we've got to identify where we're going to get the data, you know, what are the projects that we're going to try and capture data on and who are the, who are the folks that are going to be providing that information. Um, it's important to explain what data we're trying to collect and we want to define that so that everybody's collecting information the same way. What are the labor categories that we want to capture and our effort values? What are the, how do we want to break that up over the life cycle of the project uh, in terms of the, the key life cycle phases that are going on? We want to establish a timeline for the benchmark and some deliverables along that timeline so that we can assess how we're doing. And then uh, uh, obviously we're going to brief out the benchmark process and objectives. So, you know, uh, give you an overview of what the overall process is. We want to make sure that people perceive this as being a positive thing. Uh, we're not benchmarking so that we can come back and punish people if they didn't perform well. Uh, what we want to do is use it again, to identify good things that we're doing, because there are some good things that everybody does in, uh, in their organization. And then we want to identify things that we could be doing better so that we can, you know, make ourselves better over time. So we really want to try and, and uh, uh, present this in a, in a positive way and then, and, and then follow through on that, okay? Um, uh, so, you know, this is sort of the, again, the overall process is we'll, we'll send out the, we'll, Usually in the kickoff briefing, the data collection forms will, will be handed out either, you know, electronically or however we're going to collect that information. We usually provide a, about two weeks for people to go get that data um, and then report that back. So that's a, an adequate amount of time that they can fit it into other things that are going on, but it's not too long, you know, that, that it drifts down to the bottom of the inbox and, and it doesn't happen. So that will go get submitted back to the, the benchmark and consulting team internally or whoever's doing the, the, the benchmark uh, analysis. And the next thing that they're going to do is they will schedule interviews with the people that submitted the data. So typically this is going to be a project team, you know, or uh, the project manager and maybe one or two technical people that, you know, he tasks with gathering up uh, the information. And we're going to go through the data and we're going to identify if there was any missing data and we need to agree on when that's going to, going to get back. Um, there's validation procedures that we go through, so if there's things that don't seem to be, you know, jiving, then we want to make sure we understand the data. In many cases, you know, they, they didn't report it exactly the way that we needed it or, you know, maybe it was incomplete or something like that. So that's really how we make sure that we get buy-in from the people providing the data that we've got good data. And then once we've done all that, then we want to get a sign-off on, you know, we all agree, people providing the data and the people that are doing the analysis, that this, we've got the data in as good a shape as we're going to get it uh, based on how we were able to collect it for the benchmark. And once we've got that sign-off, then the, uh, you know, then the, the folks doing the benchmark are able to proceed with their, their analysis. So now we'll transition, and I'm just going to take you through what a, what a typical benchmark might look like. So I'm going to take, you know, some data, the names have been changed to protect the innocent, and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do our internal baseline and look for uh, uh, opportunities for improvements. So the, the method that we use is we'll go through and we'll try and capture up a group of projects over a reasonable recent period of time, and we're going to want to reconstruct those projects in terms of the timeline and how they were resourced over that timeline. We want to try and break the data out into some major activities uh, like, you know, requirements and design, you know, construction and test, uh, so that when we're making comparisons, if we've got some projects that are only reporting partial activities, then we, we have a way that we can compare just those activities against, the, uh, against the, the, all of the projects that we've got. Um, we'll then go ahead and generate some, uh, some curve fit trend lines to the data to establish some trends uh, in terms of schedule and effort and staffing and reliability performance. Uh, it'll also let us see some st how much statistical variation we've got within our project um, data. It'll then allow us to look at outliers. And those are, the again, the ones that we want to look you know, do a deep dive on either, you know, ones that were really superstar performers or ones that, you know, maybe didn't perform so well. Coming out of that deep dive, usually we've got some recommendations, and I'll give you an example of that in this particular case. And then we want to then 
say if we are able to make some changes you know, uh, and improve on that, what is the business case likely to be? in terms of what are the benefits for making that change. Nobody likes change, so there's got to be some carrot that's going to uh, induce us to make the change. So that's really what the business case does for us. So here's an example. We've got a little Gantt chart on the left that's kind of showing me, from a time perspective, uh, 14 projects that we, we were able to capture up. So we've got, notice here, we've sort of broke, broken them up into projects that came from our onshore development group versus projects that came from our offshore development group. Um, we, can kind of, we can get an idea on what's the overall time frame. So these projects were all, all delivered within you know, roughly a three-year time frame. And then on the right, we've just taken and constructed the resource profile. So how did the resources ramp on, peak, and ramp off of these projects? And we can see that I've got some you know, early on in the 06 time frame that were maybe in the you know, 10 to 15 range in terms of peak staffing. I've got some in the middle here in 07 and 08 that uh, had much larger teams, you know, up in the 52. And we have one pro huge project here that's got over 100 people on it. And then, you know, out on the, uh, the tail end of our timeline, we've got some small projects that have very low number of resources. And we'll circle back and kind of take a look at that because there's an interesting story to tell in terms of how the projects are being resourced and maybe some improvements that we could do there. We can also, as I said, we want to break the information, the, the data out in terms of some major activities. And these are sort of generic activities. We would customize this if there was a predominant um, life, you know, uh, development methodology that an organization was using. But generally, we've got, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? We do it, and then we deploy it. So in this case, we've got some very preliminary work that's going on. We might call that feasibility study or concept definition or planning types of activities. Then we've got some, you know, requirements and design uh, uh, activities that are going on. Then we're into our construction and test uh, out to a delivery point, and then we might you know, have a deployment or period of time where, you know, warranty period where if, uh, if, if there any defects are found during that period of time, uh, they will be fixed. Um, and if we break the, the time and effort out that way, we can start to look at what are the allocations. So here we're just looking at, on a percentage basis from the schedule perspective. These are the allocations that we're seeing. And, um, and then this is how things look when we look at the, the effort breakout. Okay. So this is useful, especially when we're looking, you know, externally, we can see, you know, are, are we putting the time and effort into the, the right activities or in a similar fashion as the, the, the data set that we're being compared to. Um, we can also then graph the data up. So we'll do it in terms of some size measure on the horizontal axis, and this can be anything. It can be function points. In this case, we're using lines of code. It can be you know, requirements, what, any valid size measure is what we would use, you know, as the independent variable. And then we're plotting that up, the data up in terms of uh, duration, effort. In this case, I'm looking at reliability in terms of mean time to defect. And then uh, maybe average staffing. So this is the, you know, total effort divided by the total time, which gives us a feel for how these projects are being staffed. And then we're looking at the key trends, you know, and obviously we can see that there's an upward slope to many of these. As the size gets bigger, they take longer, they take more effort, which we'd expect. We use bigger teams of people. So this sort of gives us the average, sort of gives us our average performance through our data set. And then we can start to look at individual projects and how far away they are from that average. And we can put standard deviations on to, again, help us look at that variation in more of a statistical way. Um, but very useful in terms of what's our average performance in these different metrics areas. And then individually, you know, if we see projects that are, you know, much, much higher on effort, uh, then those are maybe some of the outliers that we want to look in on. The other way that we can do a, sa this, a similar thing is we've got a little five-star rating system that is based on the positioning of those projects against the average trends. And it's, you know, uh, it's quantitatively based, so one star would be in the bottom 20% of the of the of the benchmark uh, that we've got, and you know five stars, you're in the top 10%. Um, we can look at those ratings either by metric for each one of the projects, uh, or we can roll across and we can sort of get a composite rating for all of the metrics uh, on a project by project basis. Because, but it becomes very useful when we want to home in on, you know, you know, I've got two projects that were one-star performers, in other words, they were in the bottom 20% of the overall data set, 
And then I've got three that were very good performers, four and five star projects. So it's just a nice way that we can do a similar type of a thing for people that maybe aren't graphically oriented or statistically oriented. You know, one star is bad, five stars are good, and which ones, you know, were some outliers that we might want to uh, take a closer look at. So we can do histograms, which give us similar information, help us see where projects on the high and low end. We can generate scatter plots for things like our productivity index, and again, it helps us out outline which are the, the outliers on the low side, which are the outliers on the high side. So different ways that we can use different, you know, views of the data in order to look at average behavior versus significant outliers that we should look at. So we did that. We went in and looked at some of those projects that performed either really well or did not perform well. And there were three things that, in this example, that came out. There was uh, there was an issue with schedule parallelism. So in other words, too much overlap between some of the early thinking and definition type work and later the construction activities that are going on. I'll give you a, a look at that in a second. There was some, also some issues with extreme staffing, both on the high end and also on the low end, where there was some part-time effort being applied. And then we noticed a lot of volatility in terms of the requirements change. So those were three things that fell out of that deep dive into those outliers that said it, these are areas that we could improve. So we'll take a look at each one of them briefly. This is an example of one of the projects that didn't perform so well. And one of the things that we noticed was there was a lot of overlap. And in fact, maybe about 100% overlap between trying to do in their design and doing their, their build and test activities. Okay? And then we noticed that there was a very long deployment uh, time period on, that was going on. And what we noticed there was there was a lot of uh, effort that was going into getting the thing stable so that they could successfully get it deployed. Um, so again, that might indicate that maybe this isn't a practice that we want to replicate. And if we compare it maybe to one of the other projects, Project 47, that had the higher five-star rating, we can see that it had a much different uh, uh, much different profile in terms of how much overlap it applied between those different activities. Um, so this, again, is a way that we can use, you know, good and bad performers to identify what are practices maybe that we, we don't, you know, want to continue to, to replicate. And we want to understand why is this happening. It turns out one of the reasons this was happening was because they were getting unrealistic schedules, which is forcing them into trying to get work done prior to having enough time to define what that work was. Okay, and uh, so we, we summarize what we found, we make a recommendation, and in this case we're recommending that we try not to overlap those activities by more than 50%. Okay. So the other thing we noticed was some extreme staffing that was going on. We had uh, one project that had a huge number of people, uh, you know, over 100 folks on it, and then we had a couple that had less than, you know, half a person, so, you know, uh, sort of part-time effort that was going on. Um, you know, both of those things can cause problems. Large teams of people introduce a lot of communication complexity, which translates into lots of defects that we tend to create and then have to find and fix, and they're very risky from a cash flow perspective. So that might be something we want to moderate going forward, or at least understand, you know, the risks when we, we, uh, when we staff projects that way. And then, you know, on the low end, if you've got people that are maybe juggling multiple projects, they're doing part-time on one, part-time on another, again, there's, there's inefficiencies that are associated with working that way. So that might be an opportunity for us to make some changes there as well. Uh, if we just took and uh, graphed up our, our data set, but then highlighted in black, we've got the, the project that had the really big team of people. Notice it had, it had some of the worst quality in terms of mean time to defect. We didn't get a lot of schedule compression on that guy, even with all those people, because it was it was one of the longer projects, and uh, and it operated at a at a lower productivity, okay, uh, and it spent a lot of money. So again, uh, another representation that might say this is not something that we want to replicate. And then on the low end, we've got these these part term projects that again exhibit a, a similar type of behavior. So again, we kind of summarize what we're seeing, and then we make some recommendations. Maybe we want to go with one to two FTEs on the low end, and maybe we want to, you know, look at moderating those uh, very high staffing levels on projects, maybe not so extreme uh, uh, number of resources in the future. And then requirements change. So here we noticed that there was a huge swing uh, on the projects, anywhere between 4% and 64% 
on the high end of requirements changes. And, uh, you know, obviously that's something that, you know, the more requirements change we've got, the more rework you've got, depending on where it comes in, and that causes us schedule, you know, cost and quality problems. So here we just took a different way of looking at the data where we used requirements growth as a percentage on our horizontal axis and then plotted up PI and notice that we get sort of a, a negative or downward sloping uh, trend to the data. The bigger, the higher the requirements growth, the, uh, the lower the productivity index was. And uh, the higher the requirements growth, the longer the duration was and the more effort and the lower the quality. So again, another way of looking at the data telling us that we definitely should do something about this because the, the, the more requirements growth as a percentage of the total system size, uh, all the metrics tend to behave in a, in a negative fashion. So, you know, again, we summarize what we're seeing, we make a recommendation. In this case, we're recommending that, you know, we, we uh, try and keep the requirements growth by you know, following some of our, our existing processes that we have in place. And now what we want to do is try and look at if we make those changes uh, to the, to, in those three areas, what are the opportunities, the benefits that we're likely to derive? So here what I've done is uh, on the left, I've got a table that kind of summarizes from a productivity, you know, a phase overlap, a requirements change, and a, a staffing perspective, um, what the current state looks like. And I've tried to put little boxes just to draw your eye to if these, like for the, for the phase overlap, we're suggesting that we don't use extreme or high um, overlap between phases. So if we go from a, an extreme uh, overlap case to if we had done these projects with a more moderate overlap, what is the likely benefit in terms of the productivity that we're likely to get? Now, we've done the same thing. It, you know, this is the type of requirements change that we were experiencing on these projects. And what we're recommending here is that we try and keep that, you know, to no more than 15%. Okay, which represents more of the average from the good projects that we've got. Um, and then, again, if we implement those recommendations on the staffing, instead of using part-time effort or huge teams of people, if we go with more you know, full-time FTEs on the low end and we go with a more moderate staffing strategy on the high end, you know, again, these are the types of, we go from productivity index of 14.2 to uh, a productivity index of 16 you know, based on how those other projects that didn't exhibit these behaviors, how they looked, okay? So we run that out. This is the, you know, how things actually happened, and we actually spent, you know, 20 million or so over this time frame. If we implement those changes and we derive the productivity benefits uh, that we're assuming, then we might get something that might look more like this from a cost perspective. So maybe now a little over 12 million and maybe, uh, maybe a little bit shorter overall duration for the portfolio. I can take and I can summarize that you know, very nicely in this depiction. And I can see from a schedule standpoint, we might be able to get a couple months of compression on the overall portfolio. Um, but I can see that there's tremendous benefits in terms of reducing the effort and reducing the cost to the tune of maybe $7.2 million in savings if we were to implement these, these improvements, okay? So, you know, this is the business case you know, to make it happen. Most people, you know, would see that as a major inducement to try and make it happen. So the next thing we have to do is we need to continue to measure. So here I've got an example of we did an initial baseline, we made some recommendations, and then we're following that baseline up a year later to see did we get the improvement from those recommendations, you know, that matches up with the business case. Okay, so uh, here we just take a very uh, simplistic uh, view. We take our trend line from our previous benchmark, and we're looking at effort, so effort over size, and uh, that's the top line. And then we've got our data that we collected up in the current time period and the average trend through that effort data. And you'll see that it's lower than the previous baseline, which means that's what you see as, as a productivity shift. You want to sh be shift, seeing these lines shift down across the entire size spectrum we're delivering projects for less effort. And then I can put that in tabular form up here where I can take and from the, we'll take it across the, the size uh, of our data set. In other words, this would be the small point, this would be the high point, and then I've got some quartiles, 25% median and 75% 70, quartiles in the middle. And I can compare the old baseline versus the new baseline, and I can then calculate across that size range 
the effort reduction that we're able to experience. And again, uh, if we can you know, take that and marry it up with the number of projects that we put out, we can start to look at how much savings did we actually derive uh, from those uh, recommendations that we made uh, in the previous benchmark. Okay. We can do a similar thing from a schedule perspective. So now we're just looking at duration. Again, we can see that the current baseline has shifted down and we're delivering our projects faster across the entire size range. So that's how we can do our, if we continue to follow up these baselines, we can compare back and see what's our improvement. Now if we did one you know, for the next year and the next year, you can compare back a year at a time, but you can also compare back three years. You know, if you want to get a broader improvement trend, uh, you know, that's, that's sometimes very useful to do. All right, so now we want to look outward. We want to say, how do we compare externally, you know, to other organizations that are in our space? Okay, so the, the method that we use here is we've got to go out and get a, a, a set of projects that we think uh, represents what we're doing. Okay, so it's got to be a, a relevant comparison set. And one of the things that you certainly want to do is make sure that the data that you're comparing is in a similar time frame. We don't want to get data from 10 years ago. We want to get data, you know, that's as recent as the data we're comparing to. In some cases, it's, it's useful to get data in a similar industry sector. So if I'm looking at financial services projects or if I'm looking at aerospace projects, then I want to be comparing against uh, some uh, projects that are, that are developed in that same uh, industry sector. And then also, as we saw, that a lot of these metrics change as a function of size. We want to make sure that the, the comparison set spans a similar size range as our projects do. In other words, we don't want to compare our data to a set of projects that are all much, much smaller or much, much larger than ours because that might skew the results. Okay? So we, there's some care that goes into selecting the, the appropriate projects and we have to display those demographics when we're presenting the results so people understand that we went, took some care to, to uh, get a, a data set that was relevant. And then we do something very similar. We, we compare the positioning of our projects or, or an organization's projects relative to the new benchmark trends that we fit through the, the industry data, okay? And then we do our comparisons. We can use our five-star report in the very same way that we did with our baselining, only now we're comparing externally as opposed to internally. And then, uh, and then obviously we want to document our observations and if there's any recommendations that fall out of that. So in this case, you know, we went in and the relevant time period was in the 06 to 08 time period. So we go into the, you know, in this case it was the QSM database that we went into. So there's 11,000 projects in there. And we were able to pull out projects that, this is the query conditions basically that we're building to go into that database. So, you know, 2006 to 2008, I also want them to be, you know, IT projects from the financial services industry because that uh, was the same industry as the company we were benchmarking. And we want the projects to span a size range of, you know, uh, you know, this sort of a size range, which matched up with uh, the demographics from the, the data set that we, we captured up. Um, we can take it a step further. We can make sure that the projects had similar sort of resource or staffing profiles if we want to. And then we need to look at how many projects came back. So in this case, we got 55 projects back that matched all of those conditions. Now, if you get something back that's too small, what do you have to do? Well, you've got to go in and you've got to loosen up those query conditions. So the, the more conditions you put in there and the tighter you make them, the fewer projects you're going to get back. And unfortunately, that's just the nature of how it goes. So in this case, we came back and we said 55, would, that would be definitely a statistically valid sample. We can go with that. If we came back with five, then we need to look at do we have to broaden up the time frame. And we want to caveat that so that when we're pr presenting the results, we, we point those things out. Then we can do things like we can compare the schedule and effort distributions with the external data set. So, you know, the blue projects are company XYZ, the red projects are the industry benchmark. So we can see, well, you know, we're typically putting a little less time into those early phases than the industry data set, but we're putting, you know, uh, about the right amount of effort into our requirements and design, or similar amount of effort in the requirements and design and construction and test activities. So you can sometimes glean some nice information in terms of where we're putting the time and the effort in those major activities. Is it similar or different, you know, uh, than what we're seeing externally? 
We can then, you know, again, here I've broken things up by phase, so I'm looking at duration, calendar time, for doing the requirements and design activities. The lighter colored trend line is the average through the financial banks benchmark, the industry benchmark, and I can look at my average and I can see, you know, is it above, below, or, right, or similar to that line. In this case, we're spending less time uh, in those requirements and design activities uh, than the industry benchmark. Um, and, you know, if I look at it in terms of effort now, I can see that on the smaller projects, we tend to be putting less effort into that, that phase. But on the bigger projects, we're putting, you know, about the same to, in some cases, more effort, you know, into, into that activity. Um, now if we look at, you know, construction and test, so this is, you know, where most of the work is going on, again, we're getting a, a similar type of a view here that uh, we, we're putting in less time to, to d develop our products. And we've got, again, for the small projects, we're using less effort but on the larger projects, in some cases, we're using more effort, okay? So again, we can tie that back to some of those staffing recommendations in the baseline that we looked at to see, well, this is that one that we used a really large number of people on, and it makes it more expensive when we compare against what other people typically spend uh, on, on a project of this size in our space, okay? Now, I could have put the, you know, I could have put the, the, some standard deviation lines on here, and what that's useful to do is to see you know, is the variability in the data similar or more or less than we're seeing in the industry benchmark? So we, you can do things like that to look at the, uh, you know, the variability. It makes the graphs a little bit more cluttered, but sometimes that's something to do with, with automated tooling. It's very easy to toggle them on and toggle them off. And then, you know, from a mean time to defect, how long the system ran when it was out there in its operational environment, we can see the two lines are almost right on top of one another. So we're delivering, or this organization is delivering uh, at a similar reliability or quality level as, uh, as, as industry, okay? So we can use our five-star assessment, only now it's against the external data set. So immediately we can use our composite rating to home in on, you know, a lot of our projects, in fact, eight out of the 14 are uh, four or five star rated projects. So that's saying, these, you know, the majority of our projects compare very favorably with, uh, with uh, our, you know, other people in our industry out there. But we've got a couple that don't perform so well. And if we were able to somehow improve those projects, then, you know, we might be able to bring our aggregate you know, which is right now a three-star rating, we might be able to bring that up into a four-star rating. And again, that's dependent on implementing some of those improvements that we discovered in the baselining process. So a very nice way that we can use our, you know, our trending information and also the five-star reporting, which displays the information a little bit different way in order to very quickly look at our projects and compare them either internally or in this case externally, you know, with a, with a industry data set. So the last thing that we want to do here is we want to take and summarize what we're seeing, obviously how, how we perform versus the external data set, um, you know, uh, uh, present any opportunities for improvement that we might see because, again, you know, that's, that those are things that we want to, uh, you know, both from an internal perspective, these projects didn't look good, but also from an external perspective, they didn't look good either. So all the more reason that we should, we should uh, implement those process improvement. Uh, recommendations that came out of the, the baseline. So with that, um, I think I've got about 10 minutes left. Um, uh, Elizabeth, I think, has been trying to compile some of the questions that you may have been entering into the, the chat area, and uh, I'm happy to take on any of your questions and, and try and answer those for the, the remaining time that we've got. Okay, and I know uh, just to make everybody aware, there's going to be a replay available, and I'll send out a link with, uh, with that, as soon as we have that up on our site, it'll probably be within the next few days or uh, week at the most. So um, we've gotten some good questions. The first is, what would be the minimum number of projects that we should target? And can I combine projects from multiple development groups? Yep, good question. So when we do this, on a service basis, when we're going in and, and trying to capture data uh, in an organization, we typically try and target 
again, it depends on the size of the organization because, you know, there's extreme cases, you know, if you're benchmarking a very, very large organization, obviously you can multiply these numbers. But let's say we're, we're doing an initial benchmarking engagement for, a, for an organization. Uh, we try and go after maybe 15 to 20 projects is a manageable number uh, that, you know, uh, a medium to large size organization can deliver up within a reasonably current period of time. Um, uh, that's usually a good set uh, that we can use. Um, if you're gathering data from multiple, multiple departments, then you want to make sure that within an, a department, you know, we want to get maybe five to seven, you know, that we can then aggregate together with other departments to get a, a larger data set. But, you know, five to seven would be sort of an absolute minimum that you can use to sort of look at the trends, make sure that your projects span an adequate size domain. Uh, but ideally, you know, we'd like to get 15 to 20. If we were benchmarking a large enterprise, then, you know, you could be looking at, you know, maybe 100 projects, you know. And uh, usually that involves a, you know, a, a larger team, a benchmarking team to support, you know, gathering up that many data, doing that many interviews, and validating that volume of data. But that, that's generally what you're targeting for. Five to seven is an absolute minimum. Ideally, 15 to 20, and you can go higher depending on the, the scope of the organization's need. What is the total duration from kickoff to presenting final results, and how much effort is required by my staff? Okay, another, another good question. Um, again, uh, I'm going to be speaking from, from QSM's experience where we've gone in and done this, you know, uh, uh, as a service engagement, um, and you know, again, we're we're pretty efficient at this because we've been doing it for over 30 years. But generally, what we target is uh, six to eight weeks from you know doing the kickoff briefing to delivering, let's say, preliminary results. Maybe not the final briefing, but at least delivering the delivering the preliminary analysis results. So we've got our kickoff. Again, two weeks is usually what we give folks to get the data back to us. Um, usually we've got two to four weeks involved with doing, you know, the analysis of the data. And then, you know, it might take us a week or two uh, to brief out the preliminary results. And generally what you'll see is you give a pre-brief, you know, to the, the coordinators before you brief up to the, you know, the senior level people. And that gives them an opportunity to, you know, see the results, give their feedback, and there might be a minor, you know, rework cycle. But generally six to eight weeks is what we're targeting to try and get this thing done within. Uh, again, you know, we don't want it to go too long because then other priorities tend to creep in and, you know, they, things can get derailed. So six to eight weeks is a, is a from our experience, is a, a, a good period of time to get one of these done. How would I get access to the external industry data for a competitive assessment? Well, there's, uh, there's a couple ways. You need to identify the the sources of industry data. So within, you know, QSM, you know, we've been capturing up this uh, industry data for over 30 years. So, you know, we're obviously a source. There's other, you know, independent standards groups out there um, that you can probably Google and, you know, find that will provide uh, ways to access their industry databases. Um, for our clients, it's actually built into, if, if it's a tools client of ours, that's built into the, you know, we've got some standard ways that we um, uh, generate the, the benchmark uh, benchmark data uh, within our tools, and we refresh that uh, on about a 24-month cycle. We're currently going through the latest update. Um, and uh, we also can, you know, customers can ask us for custom queries, you know, if they're, if they're looking at a, a new project, you know, and it's going to be a package implementation, they don't have any experience, then again, we can easily go into our database and build those queries and pull out custom data sets. So, you know, we're a source for that. Um, again, there's the, the industry benchmark tables that we make available on our website, so I encourage people to go up there and check those out. Uh, you know, those uh, are free of charge, and we, again, we try and refresh those on a, on a regular basis. Um, you know, and again, you know, if we're doing this on a, if we're, if QSM is doing this on a service basis, then that's all included, you know, within the, the scope of the benchmark service. With uh, many projects using multiple languages and multiple platforms for a single 
application or project, how do you count the lines of code? Well, a good question. Um, we would, you know, obviously we're going to try and automate that with some sort of a code counter, and there's many tools and utilities out there today that you can use to do that. Um, we're going to define the counting rules that we want to use, and typically people are trying to count in a logical fashion as opposed to counting physical lines of code. Um, and then we're going to try and identify, you know, the different languages that are involved in the database or the, in the benchmarking sample, and we'll categorize those in terms of, you know, you know, what language level we would put these different languages in. Um, and then, uh, again, we'll make our comparisons, and that might be one of the ways that we stratify the data. We might want to look at, are there any benefits to, you know, using, say, you know, C Sharp or, you know, Co versus COBOL or, you know, other types of languages that we've got going on. So that might be one of the things we look at. I, I remember when I first started with the company, you know, back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, that was one of the things that we did that we presented to uh, at a function point conference was we wanted to look at were there, you know, big benefits in productivity or differences, let's say, in productivity between different languages. And there were, there, there didn't appear to be any big productivity difference, but what there was a big difference is, is the more powerful languages allowed you to implement you know, more functionality, more function points for fewer lines of code. And that's an important thing because think of some of those charts that we looked at, the nonlinear change in schedule and effort as a function of size. So if we can use languages that are more powerful and give us more capability for fewer lines of code, you, you slide down uh, and it takes you less time and less effort and you produce fewer defects. So from that perspective, there were some major benefits from going with some of the more powerful languages. The same thing goes if there are maybe languages that encourage reusability, you know, uh, so that we don't have to create as much software. Again, you get a tremendous benefit by keeping the size of what you do have to create smaller. So. Uh, we use function points as the mean size measure in our company. Can we benchmark against other projects using function point sizing techniques? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, um, one of my colleagues just sent me a paper that we're going to be putting out in the next few weeks where he's analyzing you know, the function point data that we've got in our database. So there are a couple thousand projects that we've got that are natively sized in function points, as well as some other metrics that are in there. But absolutely, function points, if, you're, if, if that's the size measure, we've got benchmark trends that are generated from function points. There's other, again, other organization, international organizations out there that have function point information that you can use. Uh, I believe, and I could be wrong, but I believe the performance benchmark trends that are on our website for the IT, and most of our function point data is going to be in the IT space because that's where they're mostly used, but I believe the IT performance trends on the website have two sets of performance trends. One are function points and one are lines of code, so you can actually pick the appropriate ones that you want to compare with. How does TSM get the data for your industry database? Oh, uh, we collect it. A <laughs> uh, couple, couple sources. Um, obviously, one source is from our, our service work, where we actually go out and do benchmarking for organizations. And then if they allow us to, uh, they'll, in, in many cases they do, they'll allow us to go ahead and contribute that into the overall QSM database. Um, a big part of using our measurement and estimation tools uh, revolves around companies collecting their own data. Now, we, we provide industry databases with our tools, but we always tell clients, don't rely on that. When you're estimating new projects, you should be relying on your own data, and we deliver Slim Data Manager as one of the key components to the Slim Suite, which is a metric repository. So go get your own data and calibrate the tools to your own historic data. So it's a big part of our methodology. So what we do is we go around to our tool tools customers and ask if they want to make contributions back to the database. So that's another source um, where we get data from clients. And then there's other um, consulting organizations that use our technology to perform these same, same types of measurement and benchmarking 
um, uh, services uh, in their products. So again, uh, in many cases, uh, they will contribute data back, and a lot of times they make it anonymous, you know, because they've got confidentiality agreements with their clients. They'll anonymize it so that, you know, we're just, you know, we're not getting any of the proprietary, we're not identifying which company or organization is the data coming from, but we'll get the general descriptive information, you know, of what industry sector they were in and the types of projects and things like that. So a number of different areas, you know, and then I can tell you from, there's a huge amount of effort that we put into our research group that goes into, you know, validating that data, making sure that, we'll, you know, that we've got good data that's going in. And then it's important to refresh that from time to time. So we usually do that on about a 24-month cycle is where we'll, we'll have enough data in each of the different application domains that we can do a database up, update. I think we just have time for like one last question, but just to make everybody aware, once again, there's going to be a replay available, and we'll also include a, um, the link to the PDF version of the slides. Um, and feel free to follow up with us if you have any additional questions after the presentation, and if we didn't get your question, we'll follow up with you directly. Um, so. For the last question, uh, what types of projects can QSM support? Um, is it just software development? Um, the predominant types of projects in our database would be software development projects, and those would be, again, I, I showed you, we can break those out into different types of software. There's a number of different flavors of IT, there's a number of different flavors of um, uh, engineering and real-time projects, both commercial and governmental or, or defense. Um, but we're also, you know, if, uh, we although we classify them under software uh, package implementations, so implementing things like, you know, SAP and, and Oracle, uh, we've got a, a fairly large number of projects in that space as well. Um, so if you're doing that type of work, we can pull those types of things out. Um, and then over the last few years, uh, we've had customers, you know, what this benchmarking process that I went took you through, I was talking mostly about software, but you can apply it to any type of a design domain, you know, uh, a, a design project. Examples might be, you know, infrastructure projects, data centers, call centers, uh, hardware projects, integrated circuits, things like that. So uh, infrastructure projects has been a very popular area among our clients where they've been starting to capture their own data and then want to be able to benchmark, you know, how do, you know, how do my my infrastructure uh, projects look compared to external. So we're starting to build up in that area uh, as well. So predominantly software, but in, the, in some of these uh, new domains like infrastructures, we're, we're building a, 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 nice, a nice sample that could be used for benchmarking those areas as well. All right, well, thank you very much, Larry, for presenting today, and thank you, everybody who was able to attend, and stay tuned for future webinars from QSM. Thanks.